specializes in growth strategy development, sales, and marketing effectiveness, performance management systems, and process improvements in product development, as well as his executive coaching. He has worked and consulted in numerous industries, including the firearms industry. George Harris is president and CEO of the International Firearms Consultants and works with growth strategy partners, particularly in the firearms industry. He brings 40 years of experience and education to his clients in business growth and practical skills with firearms. George has spent his entire adult life working in the world of firearms. As a business developer in the firearms field, George co-founded the Sig Sauer Academy and led it to become a profit center before retiring after 21 years of service. George also earned the coveted U.S. Army Distinguished Badges for Pistol Service. Greg Foster of GAS Consulting is a sales and marketing firm with deep ties to the firearms and sporting goods industry. George spent 26 years at Remington, three years at BAE Systems, which is Armors Holding, and three years at Sig Sauer with extensive experience in the military and sporting firearms market. A reminder of the uh, NASGW's 41st annual meeting and expo will be held at the State House Convention Center in Little Rock, Arkansas on October 14th to 17th, 2014. Hotel housing registration is now open. For further information, visit our website at www.nasgw.org and click on the expo notice from our home page. Chris will provide you some instructions to maximize your experience with today's web webinar. Okay, I'm turning it over to our speakers. Gentlemen. Thanks, Mo, very, very much. Uh, everybody, this is Chris DiCenso. Uh, George and Greg, you there? Uh, I'm here. This is George. I'm here. Great, great. Um, Yes, so I'm here. Just a little admin. admin uh, we are recording this, so we'll, we'll uh, NASGW will be able to show this later. Uh, we will send out a copy of all the slides uh, when we're done also, and we will answer some questions. Uh, so if you have questions in that window that I may have just told you to close, uh, if you type in your questions, we'll get to them most likely at the end today. So, but if you could stack them up as you go, um, we'll answer them as best we can. <clears throat> today, uh, give you a little sense of, of who's here. Uh, we have, from attendees, we have everything from presidents and CEOs, directors, VPs, uh, managers and, and general managers, uh, mostly in the in sales, business development, and marketing. Uh, we also have a good mix of manufacturing companies and distributors and actually uh, a bunch of clients of ours. So it gives you a little sense of, of who's on the line. When... Um, this started, this, this concept started actually at the SHOT Show as we were uh, talking to a bunch of the executives there, uh, talking about sales, talking about, you know, do they have a growth plan, do they have a sales plan? And, you know, many of them said they didn't have a sales plan. So we said we might as well start with, you know, what are the top ten reasons why you don't have an actionable sales strategy? And number ten is, well, we talk every day. Why do we need a plan? We have a plan. It's called wait for the next spike in demand. Our sales team's too small to create a plan, Chris. I've had a hard enough time measuring their performance, let alone creating a plan for them. You know how many plans I've created, Chris? Why create a plan when it's going to change next month anyways? Number four, I have A salespeople. They don't need no stinking plan. <laughs> and number three, who needs a sales strategy so, with so much demand? Oh, wait, that ended. And number two, I'm really not sure how to create a good plan. Now we're starting to actually get into the, to the crux of this. And the number one reason why many people don't have an actionable sales strategy, I am too busy. Well, um, what we'll learn today and what we'll try to share with you today is um, some tools and techniques on how to improve you know, your sales effectiveness through developing an actionable and implementable sales strategy. And as best as we can to motivate you to take some action. And we'll start by talking about, you know, what is a sales strategy? We've broken it down to two major components, and then we'll walk you through, you know, what are, the, what are those components. Uh, let me tell you a little about, real quickly, Mo gave us a little background, but, but here's the pictures of who you're listening today. I'm the good-looking guy on the top left. Um, I think the point 
that I want to make with 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 my experience is that we got I've got the mix of both firearms experience. I actually worked for Ruger, actually Bill Ruger Senior uh, early on. Been shooting for I don't know 20, 30 years now, uh, mostly getting into three gun. But balance that with a lot of the management expertise and some of the research we've done on the seven keys to growth, which is what we'll talk about a little about growth strategy partners. Uh, the point here is the best we'd like just to help. I like to help owners and executives make their business easier to manage so they can have a good balanced life and ideally shoot more. George? Well, Mo did a pretty good job of uh, describing me. Uh, and uh, I'll just add uh, a little bit to it. I, I got involved in uh, product development as well as marketing and then on into the customer service end of things and uh, understood uh, right off the bat how important it is to uh, make sure the customer is happy, right, wrong, or indifferent. Uh, if you don't serve your customer, somebody else will. And, of course, uh, my, my forte is uh, training, could be firearms, could be uh, customer service, could be a lot of different things. Uh, I enjoy enlightening people and uh, bringing them to the next level of, of, of performance. Uh, and I'll pass it off to uh, the uh, better-looking guy, Greg Foster. Good afternoon, everybody. I've, uh, one of the key reasons I'm involved in this is just simply I have written a lot of sales plans. Um, having been with Remington for 26 years, we were required sales plans. Um, I saw the good, bad, and the ugly of them. And, of course, working with Chris and George, we've got an opportunity here to uh, pass some of this information on to you guys. And, and um, again, I've been in the industry quite a while. I used to work the NASDW shows when they were at the Brown Palace in Denver. Uh, back when I was a rep with Remington. So I've been involved with wholesalers for many, many years and look forward to uh, working with everybody here. And we, um, we met Greg recently through actually a mutual client that we have. And uh, when we were putting this presentation together again on, on sales and something Greg's done for, says 30, I think it's 50 years, uh, we thought it'd be a great addition to today. So again, Greg, uh, thanks, and, and George. Uh, for those that don't know Growth Strategy Partners, uh, we do focus on the firearm side. What's unique about us from a consulting perspective is that we've done some research to identify what drives long-term growth. And you'll see here these what we call the seven keys to growth. And so what's unique about us is that we can implement growth, whether it be revenue growth or profit growth, faster and more efficiently. And on the bottom, you'll see a small list of some of the clients that we've been working with in the industry as you saw by our bios, uh, we know the industry quite well, and uh, we've been doing, uh, I guess, I think some really, some really good work helping them. Okay, let's start by talking about strategy. Um, you know, this is a definition out of, out of Webster, a careful plan or method for achieving a particular goal, usually over a long period of time. I think the, the point that we want to make today is that the strategy, when you talk about strategy and a sales strategy, or any strategy in the particular, but sales strategy, this is something that's going to take time to execute and show an impact on the business. And the, the focus of today is really going to be on the situation is that a company is doing well. It's not in trouble. It's not in a turnaround situation or in dire needs, which unless, you know, obviously it's some of the AR companies and black rifle guns, uh, they had some dramatic turn the fourth quarter last year. It hasn't picked up tremendously just yet. But uh, we're not in survival. So the points of today are really about companies that are somewhat stable and need to build that longer-term plan. We will talk a little about um, some of the short-term actions that are needed. In fact, a lot of what you'll see today should be done short or long-term. But again, this, the tone today is more about long-term. Uh, in fact, you know, as an example, I was going to was talking to George earlier, who's been at SIG or been at the SIG Sauer Training Academy for twenty something thirty years, George. And you know, you were you were explaining how it's taken time for SIG to transition from what it started off as as a support um, department to a profit center. Maybe you yeah. want to share a little of that. Well, sure. Um, basically, when uh, SIG Arms, as it was then, and SIG Sauer now. Uh, when we moved from Virginia to New Hampshire, uh, sales had gotten to the point where we needed some support mechanisms. So uh, I was asked to co-found the, uh, the SIG Arms Academy, 
as a support mechanism. And basically, we supported the, the sales of the product at that point in time. But as time went on, we saw that uh, you know there was money to be had and, and, and business uh, that uh, we could increase uh, outside of the support mechanism. So we started to look and, and um, actually form the academy to get outside of just armorers training and, and transition and, and uh, instructor training. And, uh, you know, when we set up the, the long-term plan, we looked at, you know, being able to sell through the academy. And, uh, frankly, it took us way too long to get there. But, you know, 15 years later, uh, we uh, implemented the, the SIG Pro Shop and uh, started selling accessories. And then we moved that into to guns. And uh, uh, all the while, we expanded the courses that we did at the academy. And basically, uh, we started in 1990 with three people in three courses. And uh, currently today, um, we have, uh, or the academy has uh, 80 people working there, uh, both part-time and full-time. Uh, in the pro shop alone, which is a, a major business unit, they've got uh, 11 full-time uh, employees. And the, the academy has gone from no ranges and no property to uh, two dozen ranges at this point in time with uh, three buildings, six classrooms, and uh, uh, a, a plan to expand yet uh, as far as uh, property and, and ranges. So basically, we started off pretty doggone slow and then uh, accelerated into uh, 150 classes. That, uh, that we could teach, the pro shop, all the extra people in ranges, and uh, it's a real money maker for the, uh, for the company at this point in time. So, you know, it, it takes time, right? And, and this is for those salespeople out there that uh, type A and expect gratification the next minute, uh, this might take a little longer, a little patience. So I just want to make that point as we get into this. Let's talk about um, the, what we're going to go through today. Uh, when we look at a sales strategy, in fact, we look at many strategies, many, many projects, uh, me being the engineer, very analytical, try to break it down into components or sections. We've identified really two components to make a sales strategy successful. The first is what we call cultural, where we'll talk about the buy-in, the commitment, and the softer side of the uh, sales strategy, and then the technical side, where we'll talk about some of the assumptions the goals, what are the strategies you need to enact to support the goals, how are you going to measure your success, and reward systems. So this is what we're going to go through today uh, in more detail. In fact, when you look at it, the cultural side is really what's going to make this implementable. Um, and you'll get the buy-in and commitment that people actually uh, work the system on the process. On the right side, the technical side makes it actionable. So this is the actionable and implemental components of a good sales strategy. So before we get into that, we're going to talk a little about the question we asked you uh, when you registered, which was, you know, what do you expect demand in 2014 to be compared to 2013? And what you'll see here is that if you actually combine um, down a little was the greatest response at 31%, but you combine that with down significantly, you have over half of uh, or half of the attendees thinking that demand's going to be down, but you also have some people thinking it's going to be up a little or up significantly. Okay, now again, you start peeling this away. Well, I was talking about my company, not everybody, but the couple points here. I think most of us, or most of us, majority, do believe that demand will be down, but there's some that think it's going to be up, and the question is, how's that going to impact your sales plan? It's going to be based on what you're assuming is going to happen or, or not happen. Uh, when I did peel this back a little more, the larger companies that we have here are more pessimistic. They're more thinking that it's going to be down. So um, if it is down, you know, I guess this does support the fact that you probably need a much better sales plan or a sales plan uh, because it's going to be more challenging to sell. What I'm going to do now is um, start off with a poll question for you is to understand a little more about the audience. It's going to ask you what kind of sales strategy you have. So you should be seeing 
a, a poll on your screen asking you, you know, do you have a very robust sales strategy that has made an impact on revenues? And I'd ask you to start clicking. Uh, do you completely agree with that or, you know, somewhat agree or completely disagree? So I talk about a robust sales strategy, sales plan. We won't get uh, caught up in words. Um, you know, most of you here obviously to learn about this, so we're sure it's going to be uh, less having it. But um, just do that vote. I see good half you already voted. And then what we'll do is we'll show you the results on this. Um, OK, so you, you agree that you have a strategy, or you completely disagree. And if you're not really sure, yeah, that's the, that's, the, that's the answer in the middle. But we basically, everyone just oh, vote. That's great. So I'm going to um, close this, and I'm going to show you the answer. In fact, before I do that, I'm going to write it down. Uh, so let me show you. I'm going to close this and show you the results. And you should be seeing the results now. Uh, you'll see majority are not really sure. That's, I'm not sure how to interpret that. Um, but 11% saying they agree that they have one, 21 somewhat, but you get the 26 and 11 that completely disagree or somewhat disagree. Um, interesting. So it is a little more, I guess you get a little more not sure and somewhat disagree that they have an effective one, which is probably why you're on the call today. That's a good thing. Okay, so let's, uh, with that, let's get back to our presentation. And we'll talk now about these components. So we talked about the cultural piece, and we talked about buy-in. What, what is buy-in? What are we really talking about here? Okay? I mean, we're not talking about buying into a poker game or some gambling, but getting the organization and the people, specifically, let's say, on the sales team, to agree to um, you know, uh, accept and be willing to achieve what's being put in front of them. It's gonna, you're gonna, what you want to do here is answer some of the questions of why are we doing this? You know, you hear about all these programs that are in organizations, program of the month, program of the week, but why are we doing this? Why are we building a sales strategy? What are the benefits of a sales strategy? And, and, and obviously the what's in it for me. So in, in most initiatives, again, a sales strategy is another one, you know, why are we doing this? And a lot, often we find that management may put something together and push it out there without really any understanding of how it's going to impact the organization, or do they believe it, and do they buy into it? Um, we've had a lot of uh, clients that we've worked with where owners were talking about, or president was talking about, uh, growing 20%, 25% a year, and the organization had tuned out because they'd been stressed out already and they just weren't ready to do it. And, you know, as much as you may try to facilitate that, the, the owner's still trying to get some growth and it doesn't, doesn't get anywhere. So let's talk about buy-in first. Why are we doing this? What do you want to get out of it? So when you talk about buy-in, let's talk about the better way to do it. Recognize that your organization may take time to understand what you're trying to do. Um, involve them in the process. We're going to put a sales strategy together. Here's why. Here's what I need for you. When you start getting into goals, that's usually where organizations or projects get lost. Goals are either too high, too low, don't make sense one way or the other. We'll address those today. But when you're dealing with salespeople, again, what's in it for me? What's in it for me? And one of the things that we found very successful in the past, when you do any initiative, is put out a macro theme or goal. We're working with a, an organization right now, and the, the macro theme and goal is to improve overall performance, improve you know profitability, but productivity. And under that, there's going to be a lot of little projects of changing the organization, actually moving a facility, consolidating some locations. But all those small things are under the big goal. So when you start talking about building a sales plan, sales strategy, let's start with buy-in. Second piece is commitment. Number one reason why projects usually fail is A, they don't try, or they try and then give up. 
I'm sure there's a lot of people listening today that have attempted a project, an initiative. It went three months, six months, maybe a year, and then kind of died out um, because it wasn't working as planned. Well, everything takes time to be successful. Um, and usually, it's not always going to be right the first time, so you have to modify it. And this is that linkage with the audience, the, the organization, to understand what's working, what's not working, and modify it. When we go, when we work with clients, we're very clear up front, especially when we're making uh, organizational changes. You know, every organization is different, and what we may have applied five times before may not work here. And so we're very clear that this is a process. We're all going to work on this together. We're going to adjust a little left, a little right. But we're all going to be committed to making sure that this is going to work and we're going to adjust it as needed. And that's where you get into this follow through, follow through, and, and follow through. Um, Greg, I think you had something you want to add about this because you've seen a lot of these programs you know, get started and some worked and some haven't worked. Yeah, there's, there's one more key reason for failure uh, of sales plans or at least it's an honorable second, and that's that the person responsible for initiating the sales write-up plan in the first place fails to continue with the implementation. And he or she may require the plan to be written and then begin the implementation of the plan, but then their focus begins to wane. They get sidetracked. They go in another direction, and in a short time, it's not even on their radar. They're not following up. They're not doing anything to keep the plan going. And to me, it was always very discouraging uh, when being a writer of a plan or my team would write up a plan and have spent hours building the plan and really come up with, hey, this is going to work. This is what we're going to do. And then, uh, you know, the, the person that, that I was reporting to doesn't follow through with it, doesn't implement it, doesn't do something with it. And, and of course, one of the worst things that can then happen is that that requires a plan. And everybody says, all right, let's write this sucker, but don't worry, after two months, Bob's going to, he's not, not even going to be checking up on it. So therefore, we'll just kind of do it. It'll go away. Um, I've seen it time and time again, and it's just another reason that if the person that's implementing the plan doesn't stay with it, stay committed to it, and keep moving with it, it it's a potential for failure right there. Let's wait it out. Let's wait it out that it'll eventually go away. And I think in the invite, you'll one of the uh, bullets that we said was maybe the problem that, that the sales plan is not working is you, you being the head of sales or the writer of the plan, um, because you're not committed and following through on it. So that's one, one starting point. Thanks, Greg. All right, let's now talk about uh, building that plan and getting into the technical side. Before we jump into the technical how to build it, I want to give you a little basics on, on growth, revenue growth. Uh, in particular. It's called Antoff's Matrix. It talks about the uh, four ways to grow a business. And it's very basic, which we know about. You've got existing customers, you've got existing products, and you can sell to them. That's one way to grow. You could also get new customers or new markets, new geographies, new channels, and or new products. And they have what they call the four quadrants, where in quadrant one, you can penetrate your existing customers you can develop new markets, you can develop new products, or you could do, you know, diversify and do all of that. So this is very basic. It's actually a simple a tool we use quite often with, with clients. The point here isn't about, oh, I get that now. The question is, if you're going to grow revenues, if, you're gonna, if you want to grow, let's say, $5 million, 5%, whatever the number might be, where is that growth going to come from in these four quadrants? Where's the opportunity for existing you know, customer, existing product growth? Well, which new markets or customers should you go into, and what products should you get or introduce? And where's the revenue going to come from? So what you want to end up with is something like this. This is just an example where someone was trying to grow $5 million, and 55% of it, or $2.75 million, was going to come out of basically cross-selling, selling existing customers, existing products. And that's usually where there's a lot of opportunity for us that we don't uh, address. And then you can see where the growth is going to be coming in the other, in the other quadrants. So to develop this, the, the strategy, this is that macro strategy. Now, how do you get there? And that's what we're going to get into. So you can guess or you can analyze. Um, I'm going to 
give you the insight, which you probably figured out. Yes, you don't guess on where to go. You put the analysis together. So let me walk you through some pieces of this. When you start building your sales plan or sales strategy, we're, we all make assumptions about what's going to happen. We, we talked about demand earlier, and we've got different perspectives of what's going to happen with demand. Which customers can you grow with? Which markets? Which products? One of the big failures we've seen is that companies think through these, but they don't articulate those assumptions and document them and challenge each other. And so, you know, picture today that, you know, we had five or six people in the room and they all completed that survey about what's the man going to be. Well, if you've got five different perspectives, what do you do, take an average to get the right answer? No, you, you have to peel back, well, why does somebody think it's going to be significantly down? Why does someone else think it's going to be slightly up? And challenging those assumptions is really the biggest benefit. And for those leaders here that are writing the plan, um, need to feel comfortable with someone challenging their own assumptions because you know more people providing input will probably be a better answer. So the first thing you need to do is, is document those assumptions and in particularly challenge what you think is going to happen because that's going to drive your goals. And we do it every day in terms of what we assume traffic is going to look like and when do we have to leave or are we going to catch that plane or is that customer going to buy from us? And this is the first piece in building a successful plan is to document your assumptions, have, have the team challenge them. And again, there are assumptions. You're never going to necessarily get complete facts. But then agree upon what you think is going to happen. When you do your reviews, you want to review the assumptions you made, not necessarily not just the goals and how well you achieved them. Because if you thought you were going to do something great in a new market, We've had some assumptions about why that was going to happen. That's the first place to start. Now, to get into it, let's talk about the analysis. And I'm going to go through this fairly quickly so we're not getting stuck in data. But in this case, you're looking at a matrix of, on the left side, the list of customers. And what did they buy? Rifles, pistols, shotgun accessories, holsters, uh, suppressors, whatever the products are that you're offering. And then what you'll see is there's, there's holes. Okay, this customer here, you know, hasn't been buying as many rifles as they've been buying the pistols and shotguns or accessories or, or shipping them. And so there's an opportunity here in these little dark shaded areas are opportunities. And you may have, on the right side, we do a little calculation. Well, what do you think the sales opportunity could be for each of these customers? You add it up, and this is where you're going to start getting some numbers. But it's going to be based on the assumptions that you have on why do you think, you know, RB sales is going to get $160,000 in sales for rifles because they've never done it before. You can look at also, you know, the channels. What channels do you sell to? What market segments do you, do you sell to? Uh, the, the women market. You know, obviously having some good data is, is, is helpful. But as you start slicing through your data, you'll start finding those holes. And here's a list of uh, many other types of analysis you can do. How effective is a salesperson, the rep organization, products, customers, markets, and so forth. You don't have to conduct extensive analysis, but you don't want to pull out the dartboard. And so usually with this 80-20 rule, you know, let's 20% let's of the customers or 20% of the products drive 80% of the business. Let's focus on that small group first and figure out where there's opportunities. Typically, it's in that second category, the B customers, usually doing a good job managing the big ones. It's that second tier that isn't, isn't done well. And so as you do this, what are we trying to find out? Where do we diversify? Where do we rationalize? Rationalize, get rid of some customers that we're not making money on or some products that we're not making profits on. You know, and where can you grow? And this goes now back to those um, that growth matrix to identify which customers, which products, which markets. And as I'm always trying to do is try to find some way to hook in a cool hunting trip or something else along the way uh, so I can have some fun at it. So that's the analysis section that we're going through now to start getting to understand what goals should we put in place? Which customers, which products, which markets, which channels? 
So when you start now establishing goals, let's talk about how do you set them. There's usually two ways. We suggest a middle of the road. Typically, you look at the historical performance. We've been growing 6% or so per year. Therefore, we're going to grow 7, 8, or 9 in the future because we're going to do better. Often, someone may say, well, we need to grow. We want to grow 15% a year. Why? Well, because I think that's the way we can do it. The market's hot. ARs are hot. Pocket pistols are now hot. We're going to introduce a market our pocket pistols, and that's going to grow. What we find is that this middle of the road or balanced approach is actually a better answer and actually a better result. So you're not necessarily taking the historical performance and looking forward, and you're not picking something out in the future and going backwards. So when you think about goal setting, think about that balanced approach to setting goals. Then when you set the goal, there's a, a good way to design goals, what I call good, good goal design. You need an action, grow, increase, reduce. Who are you targeting? What are you going to grow? How much is that going to grow? This is the key piece here. Too often, there's no number or target out there. The when, and then who's going to own it. At the same time, be very clear about the revenues, what, or the definition. What is revenue? Gross revenue, net revenue. So whatever that definition is, be clear so everyone knows what you're chasing. So at the end of this, in terms of a, of a goal setting, Here's just a couple uh, goals that we've put out there, but it's been based on this, this analysis of what's going on in your business, what's going on in your market, um, and then establishing some goals on what you want to achieve. Um, Chris, Chris let, let me add something here if I could. Um, we're looking, folks, at a, at a long-term or an annual plan here. But your business may call for something shorter than an annual plan. Uh, it may need to be two six-month plans to make up the year or an emergency plan because you've got some sort of critical emergency going on within your business. Or maybe you've never had a plan. So you need something maybe even as short as a three-month plan, uh, focusing on nothing but weekly goals just to get you started down the path and get you going. And I know this sounds kind of extreme, but I've recently built a three-month plan for a client that in order for us to get our arms around the key components of their business and get them on a path forward, it was necessary to do something that was very short-term with literally weekly objectives that we could check off each week as we go during the three-month period. What that does is it builds structure and foundation that will help then begin a new direction for not only the manager that's implementing it and trying to make things move forward, but it also helps pull the salespeople together and the marketing people together so they're all walking down and moving in the same direction down the same path. Um, a short-term plan like this takes a business from being managed by chaos uh, or bouncing around like a pinball to a structured and to a focused business that you can get a handle on and you can actually move in a forward direction. Now once you get into the second month of that three month plan, which I call a DEFCON 5 plan because the short term and, and you really got a critical situation going on here, um, you begin building then a six month plan to finish out maybe the rest of the year or to kind of get you going. But you do that only if the short term plan foundation has been properly laid it's being adhered to by everybody, and the chaos structure is is being broken. You're you're now getting away from that chaos mode, and you're actually moving in a uh, in a good direction. I also want to say here that even in an annual plan, it doesn't hurt to have or plug in two or three quarterly goals that can be held up and touted to the staff and to those people participating in the plan. Uh, you know, just hey, we've achieved this, we're doing this. It kind of helps keep the fire of the plan burning, keeps everybody excited and on board, and it also lets everybody on board know that, hey, the manager's behind this. We are going forward with this, and, it, and we are accomplishing something. Very true, Greg. Um, you know, we talked today about this being more longer term, but in either case, what are the goals? And whether they are a yearly goal or a quarterly goal or, you know, weekly goal, uh, 
goals are still needed. Uh, what also is important, not only with the goals, is the strategies and how you're going to get there. So the next section after goals is strategies. And strategies is how are you going to achieve those goals. And what you'll see here is the top one, increase the average customer sale. Well, the strategies might be sell more accessories to them, uh, improve that cross-selling of the popular products, get some bundles, put some spiffs together. So after you put goals together in the sales plan, sales strategy, now what are the strategies? How are you going to get it done? There was actually an article uh, recently, I think, in the Harvard Business Review that talked about the fact that strategic plans, this is on strategic plans, but same concept, the, there's no strategies on how to get it done. And this is where I keep going back to those four quadrants because it shows you by cross-selling or getting new customers or getting, introducing new products how you're going to accomplish that goal. So the, the next section there was, was the strategies to accomplish the goal. Here's, we now talk about the measurement system. So we've gone through defining your assumptions putting the goals in place, putting the strategies in place, and now let's talk about measuring success. So when you now put the goals together, what you'll see here is that goal we had earlier, increase the average customer sale, and what you'll see is a measure okay, of measuring the average sales dollars of the customer, average customer sales dollars, to measure the goal, but also on some of the strategies in terms of selling more accessories you know, what are the increase in sales dollars, you know, um, for accessories? And so if you put a goal out there, why wouldn't you measure it to see if you're being successful or not? So when you start now building the, strat the goals, the strategies, now we get into the measures. The other thing that from the measures perspective is some leading indicators or leading measures or metrics and here you'll see some uh, measures to show are you on the right path. In fact, the, the client that uh, Greg, George, and I are all working on, you know, we're talking about some of the, the sales goals and sales strategies, and we're now starting to put in some metrics. And although there's a lot of meetings going on, the question is how many of those, which is a good leading indicator, but a better leading indicator is what's coming out of those meetings, meaning quotes, because quotes are usually a leading indicator of sales. So what are some of the leading indicators you can look at so that you don't just wait to see the results on the sales side? One of the tools we suggest you use is graphics. Um, you can't just look at any measure in a, in a short period of time. Uh, this is a, a sample dashboard from uh, Salesforce.com, which is a, a CRM customer relationship management tool that uh, we use, and we, we've actually been using for 10 years. And it's one way to, to track this. So now we'll look at the measurement systems. Then the last piece now is the reward system. Now, often on the reward side, we're looking at you know dollars uh, or, or money, giving someone the money. But ours, there's other ways, there's prizes, there's trips, there's other ways to reward the salespeople for accomplishing the goals and strategies that have been set but the point here is that you need to have one, okay? Um, and I remember talking to a client that said they had a, a sales um, incentive system. It worked really well, but they hadn't, they didn't have it now. And I asked why, and you know, guy kind of you know rolled his eyes and said, I don't know, we just haven't, we just haven't done it. So this is something that can very, very, ever see from a type A salesperson can make a lot of impact um, on on the. Um, success of a sales strategy. What I'm going to do, we've got a little less time here, so I'm just going to move on. I'll show you real quickly a design that uh, was actually introduced to us 10, 10, 10 years ago, where when you look at the goals or the team that's involved in the sales team, so how do you link this? you got your team, you've got your goals, and across the tops of the goals, and then in that matrix in the middle is what percentage of their bonus is going to be linked to achieving that goal. And you'll see that most of them have a big number in one of these goals. And usually what happens is now that you put the goals in place, they now know what linkage to their bonus is. This gets fairly complicated. We're kind of uncertain where we're going to show it today. Um, so if you have more questions on it, 
feel free to, to give me a give me a ring. Um, so let's put this all together. The, the the goal today was to help you understand how you put a sales strategy together, very effective sales plan, sales strategy. We talked about the cultural side, the needs, and we talked about the buy-in, the equipment that is needed, uh, and then we also talked about the technical side, the assumptions you need to put in place, the goals, the strategies, the measurement systems, and the reward systems. This is not very difficult. Let's, let's be clear, putting this together is not extremely difficult, but it does take time, it takes dedication, and it, it takes that follow-through that we talked about earlier. So let's think about that as we start putting this together. Also talk about, think about the, the cultural piece. It's, you can't emphasize enough the communication with your sales team and the organization on what we're trying to accomplish and why. So let me um, do this. We've got a little more time. I'm going to ask one more poll here now that we've gone through this. The question I'd be interested to know with uh, people listening is, what's the two biggest challenges you're going to have with building or implementing your sales strategy? Um, is it commitment or buy-in, or is it getting into more of the, the goals and the strategies? So if you would click on that and identify where you think the issues are, and actually, again, we'll share this with everybody so that you can get some sense from each other of where you think we're going to have the challenges. We'll show this results, and then we're actually going to want to wrap up on a few. So if you have questions uh, that you'd like us to address, uh, please uh, type those into the question area. And we'll get those in literally just a few minutes. OK, I'm seeing some the results. Just about everybody's there. Um, interesting what we're finding here. So when we, when we share this, you can remember that the first answer is really the cultural side. And the rest of them are really on the technical side. So I'm going to close this now. And I'll show you what you're seeing. And I'd like to get maybe some reaction. There it is here. Um, you should be seeing that the majority, 50%, is going to be a buy-in issue or a commitment issue. Uh, defining goals, defining strategies is somewhat equal. Measuring success is part of that next one, and 9% necessarily don't know where to start. Um, Greg and George, any, any comments on that? Just the fact that we've got, again, buy-in and commitment as that number one challenge that they're facing. Well, I, I think well, you, to you me, that's pretty gotta... interesting. That... Go ahead, Greg. Greg, go ahead. I'm sorry. It's, it's pretty interesting that obtain buy-in or commitment is the number one challenge because all you've got to do is find out what motivates your people, uh, and and obviously money is a big motivator. We just uh, did a uh, had a client where we did a, a spiff, uh, and it was just hand out cash as they were selling stuff. We handed them you know, five and ten dollar bills. And, um, you know, so it's it's really finding that motivator, taking the time to look and see what your people, you know, are excited about. Something that everybody has an equal opportunity to achieve. Because sometimes the uh, programs are built a little lopsided for the bonuses or the, the opportunities. And, you know, one guy may have a better chance than somebody else. Well, not necessarily. You've got to find that. But, um, I just found that kind of interesting to see how this pulled out that obtaining the buy-in was was uh, a challenge. Yeah, what, one of the things that I've found in working with a number of companies is uh, actual uh, employee exposure <clears throat> to the product and and use of the product. And one of the companies I've been working with uh, a lot here lately uh, has uh, had me take their entire uh, engineering staff, their entire customer service team, plus a number of the managers and actually take them to the range and shoot their products and uh, familiarize them hands-on with uh, how the customer uses these things. And then, of course, when they come back and they speak to the customer, they have total buy-in because they've got experience now that they can, they can talk about. So, you know, along with the monetary gain, uh, you know, just plain old education and making people feel like they're part of the program is, is a very important thing. 
the, the communication, you know, we work with um, many, many companies each year and, and just about every time there's weak or not enough communication. And the communication be what we're trying to accomplish. Uh, and the communication needs to go both ways. What are we expecting of you? What are you expecting of us? And that's where the buy-in comes into play. That's where the cultural piece comes into play. Let's not forget, I mean, too often I, I talk, we talk to owners and they want to double their business, triple their business, whatever the case may be. And it's been 10 or 15 years, 20 years or even longer that it took them to get to this point. Then they expect to, you know, double it in half that time. Um, this takes time, which is where we started with that slide about strategy. Uh, but that commitment is a piece of it to continue the communication. Uh, we've had uh, companies that do a great job communicating their results in performance when results and performance are good. And then when the results aren't good anymore, they stop communicating. Oh, it's bad news. We don't want to share that. Well, yeah, you know, because all, all the employees are going to do is start guessing. So um, this is interesting. It's, it's actually very interesting to see that commitment and buy-in is, is the challenge. Um, we see it a lot. Uh, and it gets encourage you to Im improve the communication and also uh, communication both ways. Uh, let's go well, back I think, to... I think one more thing too, Chris, is, is when, when people feel like they're kind of part of the process, you know, they've got a little bit of input and there's some dialogue going both ways, that increases the, the, uh, the thought of commitment to what they're doing. They're all pulling the rope in the same direction which is, is extremely important. And of course, when they're left out there in the, in the ocean by themselves, it's like, hey, what the heck, you know, why bother? Nobody else cares. They won't tell me, so why should I care? All right. So I got a, a few questions coming in. Uh, if you have more, we'll get to those in just a minute. Um, in fact, we're going to do that right now, actually. And what was one that I saw earlier? Uh, the question was, I'm going to move back. What was the, um, in today's business climate, what is considered a long period of time for a growth plan, three years, five years longer? Um, whether it be a growth plan or a sales plan, I'll answer it and then I'll open up to, to George and, and, uh, and Greg. We, we'd like to see a three-year plan. That's kind of our targeted time frame. Uh, usually, you know, four or five years is a little too far out to, to look out. The assumptions get a little a little weak. Um, you know, one and two is kind of short. Uh, we'll target a three-year plan, but then build one and two-year increments to get there. Okay, so you may look out three years, but how do you build the one, two, and three? And I think to Greg's point earlier, you might have some quarter one, quarter two, you know, mini goals within that uh, to show progress. Uh, George, Greg, want to add to any of that? Yeah, I, I, I agree with that. Uh, I like to have a, you know, kind of a, a three-month plan right on the uh, on the front burner, so to speak, which coincides, you know, with the annual plan, and uh, you know that kind of helps keep us on track, you know, as we achieve different goals. And of course, at the academy, it took us a whole lot longer than that, but uh, you know, it it was uh, timing and how business came into us that allowed us to 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 uh, move forward. I, I kind of look at it as a layered plan approach, very much what the, you guys have just said. The fact that you've got a three-year plan that's out there that's kind of where you want to go, but because of, you look at our business conditions right now, they fluctuate for so many reasons. It's, it's incredible. But as long as you've got a plan that you're working toward that you'll be able to be flexible enough to move that long-term plan, then you've got an annual plan that you're definitely trying to get accomplished this year um, things that you want to do, the direction you want uh, particular products to move or that you want to focus on. Maybe it's the higher margin products. Uh, obviously, right now, you certainly don't want to be focusing on uh, purchasing more black rifles because we seem to have an abundance of those. But at the same time, looking at the accessory, that's where your plan should be because people bought a ton of rifles in the last few years. Now they want to dress them up. They want to do something different. So that's where the sales plan should maybe that actually links into the, the now the question is oh. right now. Sorry, Greg. Uh, another question is: What are the key strategies within the firearms industry 
during trailing demand. So someone's looking for the answer here. Is the target more engagement with distributors, direct to dealer, big box? Um, so the answer to that is really what makes a company competitive. Where is it that you have the biggest benefit? Um, so in some situations, it may be you know uh, distributors. In other cases, it may be direct to dealers. Um, that's hard to answer, obviously not knowing the, the situation in your business right now. This is where the analysis comes into play and, and where we push a lot into that uh, first quadrant, quadrant one, selling existing to existing customers, existing products and services. Every time we've worked with a business, there's never been a time when we've looked at the analysis and, and they said, oh, we're selling everything to everybody that we can. We're, there's no way we can sell anything to existing customers. Um, and so that's why it's always called quadrant one. That's where the focus should be. Then the question is, you know, quadrant two was the, was the top right, which was new customers, and lower left was products. But it could be products is easier to grow your business rather than new customers or markets. So this is where the analysis comes into play. And I, I don't want to uh, evade the question, but it really is dependent on your business and where you have strengths. You know, the, the challenge that, you know, kind of personal pet peeve myself, uh, being a, a three-gun guy and, and, and liking the ARs, is there's so many AR companies out there, and, and they're all, I personally think, doing a poor job differentiating themselves, you know, which is great for consultants to get some more work. But it depends on every company. Each company could compete differently in the AR market. Uh, whether it be accuracy, reliability, quality, low price, you know, Cadillac. I usually use the BMW approach. So that's where the analysis comes into play, and that's what we'd ask you to uh, to look at. Um, last question, I think, and then we're gonna we'll wrap this up. And the question is, um, you know, what's the benefits of a sales strategy? Which is interesting because we did not address that today. Um, uh, I, I don't. I don't like saying why you got to do things. I, I don't know if we should just assume that people understand that a sales strategy or any strategy or plan is going to help you sell more and sell more effectively. Um, again, there, there was a there was a client. They had ten salespeople. I asked the owner. I said, you know, what are they selling? Are they selling to new customers? Or are they selling to existing? And he said he wasn't sure. And I said, what's your guess? And he said, I think 70% of the time they're going to new customers and 30% to existing, which fits a lot with the type A salesperson that likes to chase new things. Well, when we did the analysis, it actually were, it should have been reversed. It should have been 70% to existing and 30% to new because there was great benefits there. So it becomes a focal point to get more effective sales and easier sales. We've seen the quote or picture a few times that it's seven or 11 times more difficult to sell to a new customer compared to an existing, but how often do we act on that? So the benefits of a sales strategy is, is focus and aligning your, your team on where the greatest benefits are for the company. And you know, I'm gonna kind of go through and, and wrap up here. You know, I talked before about this is your plan you need to get the cultural buy-in, which we, we know now we have some challenges with, we all have challenges with, but then you also gotta put that technical piece together and define where are the goals and strategies that are gonna make your business more effective. Uh, another preaching theme that we have about growth is it's not about necessarily what you're doing, it's how you're doing relative to your competitors. So if you're doing a better job than your competitors, you should be better you should be growing more efficiently and more effectively. So that'll bring us into, you know, what are you gonna do about it? We always like that. So how do you get started? Let's assess your challenges with your team. Sit down with them. If the big challenge is commitment and buy-in, let's have the open discussion about why are we not um, being effective? What's, why are people aren't buying in? Quite often, you'll hear, as you know, you know, well, the goals don't make sense. There's no way in whatever we're going to hit them. Uh, or, you know, we don't even know how we're doing. 
So understand what your challenges are first. Fix that cultural aspect. You know, we're not surprised to see that cultural piece being the number one challenge, which is why we address it here in number two. Fix. I, I use that word in quotes, right? Fix the cultural aspects. Maybe start simple with one goal, two goals for each salesperson, but back it up with uh, that management system with, you know, um, some goal setting, the measures of success reporting. Uh, they might need some coaching and some help, whether it be chasing leads or overcoming objections. And then what tools do they need? The, the thing that you know, we'll throw out there from a, a sales a, a perspective is if you need help, ask for it. Whether it be us or some other experts in the field, if you're having challenges putting plans in place or being successful, you know, ask for help. Um, you know, we, we put sales plans and business plans in in 30, 45 days because we know how to do it. We've done it over and over again. So that's where we can be helpful uh, to you. Uh, I'm gonna. We have the last slide, which is just our, our contact information, so you'll see that. And we've got about one minute. If Greg or George have one thing you want to add, Greg here. Actually, I'm good. I appreciate everybody joining in, and if there's anything we can help with, uh, don't hesitate to give us a call. We'd love to work with you. Yeah, and on top of that, uh, you know, there are a lot of things that. Um, uh, Greg Foster can do and, and that International Firearms can do and, and Grow Strategy Partners. And uh, frankly, with all the experience that we've got uh, in the industry, uh, there's probably not a question that we don't, we don't have an answer for or an avenue of uh, overcoming. So uh, give us a call. Give us, get in contact with us and let us see if we can help you. A phone call doesn't cost you a nickel. So uh, we'd love to hear from all of you. And thanks for attending the show today. Thanks, George. Thanks, Greg. Thanks, Mo. Um, we'll get the presentation out to you maybe today, if not tomorrow. If you do have questions that we didn't answer, please give us a ring. Um, have a good week, everybody. Bye-bye.